So good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third session of our Living with Lars series. Uh, some of you were present for the previous two uh, back in October, and we are so incredibly excited to, um, to have our, our third and final on pelvic floor therapy. Um, and so without... Um, before we get started and before I introduce our guest speaker and our moderator, I'm just going to give a little, um, a little push, <laughs> no pun intended, for our upcoming events at, uh, at CCC. So uh, first off, we have the community patient community conference, which you'll see, you know, is in back of me. Um, the dates are the 17th and the 18th of May, two half days. Um, to register for free, please just in the chat, I put the link. Um, feel free to register. We would love to have everybody there. It's our second annual and it's really exciting uh, where we have patients and healthcare professionals on panels together discussing really important topics related to colorectal cancer and uh, both clinical and psychosocial topics. So it'll be, it's a really great agenda. You can view it online. Uh, also registration for the in-person and virtual push for your tush is on now. So it's, I think it's across four cities. Um, couldn't get it going live in BC this year, unfortunately, but it will be virtual. Um, so follow the link in the chat. Uh, you'll see the dates for the various cities and uh, you have all the information there. And if there are any questions, you can certainly give us a shout at info or send us an email at info at colorectal cancer, I'm writing it, uh, colorectalcancercanada.com. Okay, if there's any additional questions. So uh, for now, uh, what we'll do is it's going to be more of a discussion this evening uh, between uh, physiotherapist Susanna Britnell and our moderator, Connie Pickett, who I will introduce shortly. And uh, then we will have a um, then we will have a series of, uh, you know, a Q&A after to address any additional questions that you all may have, because I know this is a hot topic and, and many people have their own personal questions. So we will have time for that. Um, so let me introduce uh, Susanna Britnell, who is a Vancouver-based registered physiotherapist uh, specializing in pelvic health, persistent pain using the biopsychosocial model of care. Uh, Susanna works with clients of all ages and genders in the areas of pregnancy and postpartum, orthopedics, pelvic health and persistent pain, including genital pain and bladder, bowel, and sexual pain concerns. Uh, she has worked at BC Women's and the interdisciplinary team at the Center for Pelvic Pain. Uh, she is an adjunct professor in the UBC Masters of Physiotherapy program and is an instructor for ROST therapy, ROST, I don't know if I mispronounced that, I'm sorry, <laughs> and pelvic health solutions. Uh, Susanna has also co-authored several papers with the Center for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis and is a mentor for the Pain Science Mentorship Program. Uh, she has also served on the CPA Women's Health Division and Pain Science Division Committees. So I personally wanted to know what Susanna did with all her spare time. <laughs> Quite an accomplished um, lady we have with us tonight. So we're incredibly pleased and grateful to have your presence, Susanna. Uh, Connie Pickett is a stage three rectal cancer survivor who herself has endured the effects of Lars. Um, she offers peer support to the Colorectal Cancer Canada patient community, and Connie has recently become a certified counselor and coach, assisting people in realizing and taking steps to achieve their true potential. So we're incredibly grateful to have Connie with us as well, who is a huge advocate for our community. And uh, without further ado, I will, I'll be moderating the chat and I will allow these two lovely and accomplished ladies to begin. Thanks, Hannah. Um, and thanks, uh, Susanna, for joining us today. Um, how it will work, uh, Hannah mentioned it. As we go along, feel free to type questions into the chat because Hannah will be um, looking at them throughout, especially if they relate to the, the section or the topic that we're talking about specifically, whether um, uh, we want to continue that discussion a bit further. Uh, or you can also wait to the end and uh, we will do a 
continued Q and A and get more in depth if needed, if there's anything that we've missed. Um, so Susie, sorry, Susanna, I'm so used to calling <laughs> her Susie. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, now I know many Lars patients um, have heard of pelvic floor therapy. Um, it's something that I think has a, a lot of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Hesitation around it because you don't always know what's involved. Um, as a Lars patient, you'd think that we wouldn't necessarily be bothered by being more poked and prod, to be honest, but you do, you get to your breaking point. And physio just is one of those things that you go, oh, I don't know if I can do it because it sounds like a lot of work and invasive. And also, you know what? Um, everyone thinks they can just do Kegels, but I know it's a lot more than that for a fact, because I've experienced myself and done my own research and, and go to my own. So can we start the session today with some of the basics, like explaining what pelvic floor therapy is and why it's important for both men and women? Would you mind starting us on that? Absolutely. So thanks for having me. Um, I just want to clarify, I'm not currently a mentor for the science, pain science division. I was a while ago, so I just like things to be accurate. Um, okay. Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, um, you know, anyone that is considering working with uh, physiotherapists and pelvic health will, will really want to know what it entails. Um, and it's true, some people... Um, have heard about it and they might be curious about it, but I do have a lot of clients that do come in and they, they really still don't know what it is they've come in for. Yeah. And um, just to be straight up and clear is that um, I practice in pelvic health, I perform internal exams, but I would no way um, ex uh, tell a client that they had to have a pelvic exam or internal exam as part of their treatment. This is one of the many things that can be offered as a way to assess in more detail someone's pelvic floor and therefore make more of an accurate and an individualized treatment program that's really gonna meet the needs of that person in particular. Our pelvic floor muscles are inside our pelvis. So mm -hmm. that is the challenge. There are some muscles we can feel on the outside, that's true. We're probably all sitting on them right now. Um, and we could probably, uh, you know, feel them on ourselves and perhaps feel a contraction on the outside and a relaxation on the outside if we know where to put our fingers. But um, a bulk of the muscles are inside the pelvis, which means that we need to directly palpate those muscles to know exactly what's going on with them. Um, so many people go to so many different places like an exercise class or yoga or what, whatever it is and are told to do a pelvic floor contraction or a Kegel as part of whatever exercise they're doing, or they might be working with a trainer or even a physiotherapist that doesn't do internal palpation. And that practitioner or that teacher or the person themselves very likely will not know whether someone is doing the correct pelvic floor contraction relaxation skill because the muscles are inside um, someone may feel like they're doing something correctly only to find that perhaps they weren't. Um, when there is research to support that, that um, there are um, a high number of people when they're doing a Kegel or a pelvic floor contraction think they're doing it correctly only to find on assessment that they're not. And so there is a role to play for having an assessment to clarify, first of all, where are these muscles we're talking about? Cause that's one thing that can be quite confusing. Secondly, what exactly are we trying to do when we're doing a Kegel? Third is, do I actually need to be doing Kegels? Because a huge majority of my uh, client population actually need to be doing um, the opposite with their pelvic floor, for example, letting go of tension because there's too much tension there. They don't need to be contracting and holding. That's a long answer to your question. Sorry about that. <laughs> but it's very No, it's very um, informative because you're right. Um, the letting go of tension is, is, you know, that is something I didn't even realize was, um, you know, a factor. I thought it was just a matter of, you just have to get your muscles really tight so that you can hold better. 
Um, but yeah, even in my case, I found it was the opposite and I didn't even realize that until yeah. I went to pelvic floor therapy. So you mentioned internal palpitations. You, um, when you're saying that, is that something the, um, the physioist, physiotherapist does? Yeah. So palpation meaning touching. So with a gloved yeah. finger, yeah. either going through the vagina or through the rectum yeah. can put the finger onto the pelvic floor muscles inside the pelvis. Um, so the muscle groups that are inside, that is the way we can um, palpate them. Okay. Or touch you, them or assess them. You know, when you talk about um, doing them correctly, mm -hmm. right? I originally thought that the muscles were pretty much just in the front. Um, I knew there was muscles in the back, obviously, to, because a lot of us have no rectum. So um, until you get to that phase, you really have to start thinking about using those muscles again. But it's, 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 if you can show us um, where the pelvic floor muscle is, the basic anatomy, I think it'll give us a better idea on um, the area you're talking about. Would you mind yeah. walking us through yeah. that? I have a few slides and in actual fact, a bulk of the muscles are at the back. And when they contract, they contract from the back up to the front in an upwards motion. Um, so let me just, um, first of all, here's just showing us the area where the muscles sit. Although they're not really just like a hammock here is what this diagram is showing. They're actually way more funnel shaped, which I'll show you in a couple of pictures. But we can see that they fill the space at the bottom of the pelvis. So no matter what age you are, what body parts you have, you have pelvic floor muscles. And if you're having a problem with bladder or bowel control or sexual function, very likely gaining more understanding of your pelvic floor is going to be a helpful part of your journey in improving your quality of life and function. So here's a picture of the pelvic floor muscles. So on the outside, remember I was saying that we can touch the muscles on the outside. So some of the muscles, which are really, um, this is the pubic bone. These are the seat bones. Back here will be the tailbone. So we have muscles kind of coming around the front bottom part of the pelvis, around the genitals and around the anus. So that's the, a little bit of a picture of our anal sphincter. And that's the muscle that we squeeze if we wanna stop ourselves from passing gas or stool. Mm -hmm. We can see down here um, with um, different body parts that the muscles are basically the same, but because there's no vaginal opening, it's the penis in this picture, these muscles are, are together. They're not separated like they are here. And then again, we have our anal sphincter. So we can touch these from the outside. But here are the muscles that are inside. So this is a person facing to the right. This is part of the backbone and tailbone here. And these are the muscles um, that are inside the pelvis. So this is actually showing the anal sphincter from this perspective. And these are muscles that are basically going from pubic bone back to the tailbone. You can see this is really more like a funnel shaped, not like a straight, um, um, line of pelvic floor muscle, like the first page or the first picture I just showed you. And so um, these muscles are not on the outside. So to be able to feel what's happening here, if someone were to have an exam um, with a, just a very gentle finger into the rectum, these muscles would be able to be um, assessed. And so basically someone could contract and relax those muscles and the therapist would be able to feel the quality of that contraction is it actually a contraction? Can they let go of that contraction? And it's a very gentle exam. I, I hear you though, I can completely understand that after going through so many um, tests, so many investigations, so many medical procedures, that this would just seem like one more thing and, and I get it. And so I think there is probably a time and a place when something like this might feel more like a good fit for someone at some point, and if it doesn't feel right at, at a time, that's okay. <laughs> you know, um, working on uh, with a physiotherapist, um, having the examination, um, which is only a very small part of this picture, but then working on some of the strategies takes attention, it takes some time, it takes, you know, a bit of a commitment to oneself. And so it's not always the right time um, for someone. And um, 
when it becomes more of the right time, then it feels like there is a bit more energy to invest in in um, in working on this and in, in a, a type of um, therapeutic therapeutic journey into changing the things that you can change through pelvic physiotherapy. Yeah. So I don't know. Can you tell by these pictures that there's just more of a funnel shape, which really helps yeah. with continence? These are muscles like this muscle here is called pubo rectalis, and this is one of the best muscles ever because can you see there's an angle in the rectum here it comes down and then it changes here like a kink that helps us keep continent and this muscle stays contracted when we're up and moving around until we're ready to have a bowel movement and then this muscle needs to relax so this can straighten and allow the bowel movement out so our pelvic floor muscles really play an important role in not just supporting the organs inside our pelvis or helping with back and pelvic support and stability, but really incontinence. They help to prevent the loss of stool or loss of urine um, when it's not appropriate, um, but also to allow the stool and the urine to come out when someone wants to be able to um, use the bathroom. And so the challenge is that when we're talking about um, someone experiencing Lars, for example, is that there's this pelvic floor piece, this pelvic floor function piece, but it's not just about the pelvic floor. Um, there's so many other components to, um, to what could be helpful in trying to reduce symptoms and improve quality of life. We can talk about those things as we go through our chat, but the felt pelvic floor piece is, is one of the things that we can assess in a physiotherapy session. And the challenge is that it's really hard to get that information directly without an individual assessment. You can do generic exercise programs. You could work on Kegels at home, but if you're finding that you're not improving, it is very possible that um, an assessment could give you valuable feedback as to what you can change um, in hopes to improve further. Right, so I'm, I'm wondering, for a lot of us who don't have a rectum, would any of those muscles um, that you're talking about, do they go right into um, past the rectum? Uh, well, the muscles um, of the pelvic floor, the, the one that we have control over is the external anal sphincter and okay. that's on the outside. So that is still going to be there. So even okay. though your rectum's gone, that's still there being yeah. able to be strengthened. Yeah, okay. however, um, it's, it, there's, you know, we've talked it, we'll talk about this as well, but there's the stool quality piece that, that also is really, really important in terms of being able to, um, be continent. So one of the, the problems and concerns with Lars is having really soft liquid stool. That's really challenging to hold in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, someone could have really good pelvic floor control, but if they have liquid stool, regardless of what they've experienced, perhaps they have, they've never had um, abdominal surgery, they've never had rectal surgery, they have a, a, um, a normal rectum, but if they have liquid stool, that person's going to have trouble holding that in, even if they have a rock star pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So the pelvic floor function is one piece of this, but the other piece is the stool quality. And so if the stool can be bulked more, that is going to give someone more success of being able to hold stool in and be able to get to the bathroom where they can move their bowels um, with control. So it, you know, if someone has liquid stool, you cannot do enough pelvic floor contractions to stop that. Yeah. It's just, no. it's too challenging. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Uh, Susie, it's, it's super important to get the consistency right for one. And we're all aiming for, you know, um, what is it called the Bristol Myers number four is that we're all yeah. trying to aim for. Um, yeah. And diet's always a challenge. There's no doubt. There's also gas. That's a challenge. And even though um, someone might be trying really hard, there's still that muscle that um, unfortunately with Lars, gas just escapes, right? So that is part of the pelvic floor being strong enough, no? 
Yeah, there's there's an internal sphincter. So we talked about this external sphincter, but there's an internal sphincter. And this sphincter is not within our voluntary control, but this sphincter is like very closely intimate with the rectum. So I imagine it could often be affected if there, you know, if, if most of the of the um, rectum has been resected. Um, this sphincter actually has such a interesting um, function. So it basically detects with sensors what is coming into the rectum. It helps to give signals that something has arrived. It helps to sample it and get a sense of, is this gas? Is this stool? What are we dealing with here? Can we relax and let go of, of some gas? Do we need to hold it in because it's stool? And so if someone has some changes to that internal rectal sphincter, if it's become damaged in some way, it would be harder to tell, first of all, if something was in the rectum. Secondly, what it is. Um, and, and, um, and so I think that the messaging that changes, if those, though that internal sphincter has been changed would also make things more challenging to mm -hmm. hold in gas, for example. Um, but yeah, the external anal sphincter is one of the primary muscles for holding in gas. And so if, if someone was having trouble holding in gas, they had more success at holding in stool, say, um, they could have their strength of the external anal sphincter assessed by a physiotherapist. And if there are some problems with weakness, some problems with coordination, then that is something that could definitely be re rehabilitated. Okay. So when you mention um, the rehabilitation, mm -hmm. maybe this is a great time to go into some of the techniques techniques then. But I did notice actually one question while we're on this. Oh, is great. Someone had mentioned about the J pouch impact and, and does it impact the muscles and physio treatment? Do you know much about the J pouch? No, I'm, I don't think I can answer that question. So I would, I would okay. hate to not answer it correctly. Okay. No problem. Go ahead, Hannah. Did you Sorry. Know? There was actually once we're on that, there was another question I was going to reserve. Uh, wait, was it for the J pouch? Um, yeah, how does it, uh, the treatment, but there was another one. Um, yeah, uh, someone had asked, are, are all the muscles still intact, even if the, if the rectum is gone? Did we just address that? Did I miss yeah. that? Yeah, okay, there could, yeah, there could be loss of internal rectal sphincter, but the external anal sphincter is, okay. uh, will be, will be there. Okay. okay. We had another question about, um, about interventions like, uh, the Kegel throne. So I don't know if that was part of, uh, part of your presentation, Susanna, but, um, if, if that's something you could speak to as well, uh, yeah. somebody was asking about the chair that uses high intensity electromagnetic energy. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. So sure. I, I don't, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Sharon, we'll get to your question shortly too. Um, so let's get into a little bit, if you don't mind, Susie, in regards to the types of um, treatment that is available for someone who needs pelvic floor therapy. Yeah. First of all, um, a assessment and some type of tactile biofeedback from a physiotherapist. This is where you're going to get that individualized assessment as to what your pelvic floor function is like. Can you connect with those muscles accurately? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are using their abdominals, they're using their buttocks, they're using their inner thighs, they're using everything except their pelvic floor, or they're using their pelvic floor and everything else. So if we think about um, continence, it's a management of pressures, right? So if you imagine this space holding pressure, and so what we wanna try and do is allow our muscles, our deep back muscles, abdominal wall muscles, diaphragm and pelvic floor, manage pressure well, so there isn't excessive pressure pushing down. So if we are having urgency, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's gonna be pressure coming down, right? Okay. Um, so that's why we're trying to hold in with our pelvic floor, we're trying to, hold in against that pressure of that stool being there or that gas or whatever it is. So if we're trying to do a pelvic floor contraction, but we're squeezing with our abdominals, we're holding our breath and straining, that's gonna increase the pressure and it's going to increase the urgency and it's going to make it even more difficult to hold something in. 
So learning how to contract the pelvic floor in a much more specific way without increasing pressure from above is going to be much more effective. And this is something that can be learned through that assessment. Okay, and, so that's the first thing. Yeah. Can it, I just intervene just, for one second? Oh, yes, Do you mind? Of course. No, I, I had a question just about time frame because I had written it down in my questions and then you know one of the uh, attendees had also asked it. So I'm very curious to know, like, is there a specific time frame post-surgery, let's say, like you're talking about, you know, the, the muscles being at a certain, you know, certain capacity or certain weakness. So is there really like an ideal time for this assessment to be done by a physiotherapist post-surgery or post-radiation, post-treatment? Well, first of all, I would say if, if someone has an up and coming surgery before. Really? Mm-hmm. Yes. So oh, prehab. Okay. Because, prehab, because prehab. if like you're, you're trying to connect and, and meet your pelvic floor muscles, mm-hmm. it's easier before something's changed then you have this kind of muscle memory to go back to, or you have an experience of what it felt like to go back to. But that being said, of course, that's not going to happen always in an ideal world. Um, Afterwards, it's going to be based on tissue healing and based on what the surgeon would like. So I'm not going to speak to that time because that's probably going to vary depending on the type of surgery and the surgeon. But basically, as soon as um, the surgeon is okay with someone having a digital exam, that means that they could have that internal exam. However, there are some things you can do just with a surface exam as well, or with some of the tools that I'm going to show you in a few slides. Um, So, you know, if someone is having um, a lot of difficulty and they want to check in with a physiotherapist just to get a sense of how to make some changes with their pelvic floor, we can observe from the outside if someone's doing a contraction, because we can see that movement. If we're looking at the skin on the outside, there is some movement and lift with a pelvic floor contraction, and then um, we can see the relaxation. So there's some things we can do from observation. But the Um, manual, like the digital is the most accurate, I guess, indicator. It just allows us to palpate more internally to feel the muscles that are inside. But okay. basically anything is better than, than not, right? Yeah. And so as pelvic floor physiotherapists, we're really used to being creative, being adaptable, based in the exam on our clients' needs, what they feel comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that's just part of our job. So um, it's okay. And it's really important that people feel comfortable to express that with their physiotherapist. Okay. Um, you know. You, the first visit, you don't know the physiotherapist. It's a new room. It's a new person. They're asking all these questions. So it, it, it's understandable if it can feel uncomfortable. And so that physiotherapist is not going to want their, their client to feel uncomfortable. They're going to try and make them feel as comfortable as possible, take things slowly. Um, yeah. There's many different ways to start off with an assessment. Okay. So even if, they're, with, yeah, even if the tissues are intact or they've healed sufficiently, the person's emotional state may not have healed sufficiently to be in that situation, you know, which is an important thing. It's another exposure. It's another intervention. It's another, you know, it's so that's important also to note, I guess. Um, We just had one question just about timing. So somebody who's asking um, how far in advance would you recommend that somebody, if they're doing the preventative uh, prior to surgery, how far in advance would you, would you recommend? Well, I think um, if, if they suspect that they might have some troubles already with their pelvic floor. So, so there is some research showing that people going into surgery, if they're already having issues, um, with, um, continence or continence or poor control or what have you, that they might have a higher chance of having problems after. So it makes sense then to give yourself some time to work on some things beforehand. Okay. Sometimes it might just be a check-in, right? And, and just to have the physiotherapist confirm that they've got a good contraction, relaxation, their strength is good, their endurance mm-hmm. is good. That's fantastic. This is what it feels like. This is what we're going to work on. Um, but there might also be, it's not just about the pelvic floor. So there might be some suggestions about toileting position, about evacuation uh, um, okay. strategies, um, there could be some abdominal massage. There could be all of these different things that um, 
might be put into practice. And, and those are a lot of the things that we would work on post-surgery as well, of course. So yeah. a lot for people to do outside of the treatment room as well. Important to consider. So that is the, the most important thing. Okay. Working as a physiotherapist in any area is making sure that we teach people self-management strategies that are successful, that they can implement themselves. So what we do not want is to, to have someone coming in over and over and over without them learning what to do for themselves. So we're really interested as physiotherapists at empowering people to take control of their own health um, successfully and, and to, to work with self-management strategies long-term. Um, so, so the, you know, in terms of frequency, because that's a question we, we also have a lot is how often do I need to come in? It's not like someone would be coming in regularly. It's not like a regular maintenance type situation at all. It would be more, again, that individualized assessment. What are the needs of this person? What do they need to learn? Um, so first of all, it might be they need to learn how to find their pelvic floor. Then it might be they need to learn how to con concentrate on those muscles, contract, and then relax them. Now they need to be able to contract the muscles when they need them. Now they need to be able to relax their muscles when they need them. So then that's that functional integration of that muscle piece because someone could have really good pelvic floor contraction relaxation, but they might struggle a bit about bringing that into function. And so that's the other piece that they can work on. Um, so it's, it's basically a layered approach based on where someone's at. And you know, all of us listening here will probably have differences in how we would present. Um, and so that's why individualized approach is so important because we don't want someone working on something that they already can do. We would take them a step further. But at the same time, we wouldn't wanna give someone, you know, if they're reading on the internet to do 30 pelvic floor contractions, Kegels a day, but they actually aren't even doing a pelvic floor contraction correctly at all. Then they're doing 30 contractions of something, but it's not what they need. So this mm -hmm. is why that individualized assessment can be helpful. Yeah, and I would imagine um, at least one of the things I learned was, yes, uh, I was told to go to pelvic floor therapy before I actually had my reversal. So at that point, there was a year and a half of um, no use in that area, mm -hmm. right? So I had to relearn, like you said, the connection between mind and body, because although I had, it was fairly strong, it was um, not working on the right times. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So it's like you said, the, the um, contraction versus the relaxation, we might think we're doing it right, but then having the biofeedback showed me, it was like, what, what do you mean? It's, it's strong most of the time. And then when I need it, it's not. So yeah. I found that yeah. very interesting. And I wouldn't have known that um, unless I had biofeedback. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, there are some really amazing uh, modalities that we can use in physiotherapy um, to help with that. It just reminded me, one of the things that you're mentioning reminded me of something called dyssynergia. So this is when it's really interesting, but sometimes when someone's contracting their pelvic floor or they think they are, they're actually relaxing. And then when they think they're relaxing, they're contracting. So they've got it opposite. So, so you can imagine if someone has urgency, bowel urgency, and they're trying to use their pelvic floor contraction to control it, but actually they're relaxing. It's not going to be effective, right? And so yeah. that's why that uh, being able to get a sense of what someone's doing at the time when they're trying to contract and whether that's actually what's happening is so important for that person to understand. Because when you're trying to use your muscles intentionally to try and control something, you want to be using the right strategy. It you sounds like it's a mental practice helpful. just as oh, much as it's a physical practice. <laughs> it's like a hundred percent brain, yeah. right? It's that, it's that the thing is, is that these pelvic floor muscles have a automatic function and they also have a intentional function, a voluntary function. So we can contract and relax these muscles when we think about it, right? But when we have increases of intra-abdominal pressure, when we're moving, coughing, sneezing, laughing, pushing, pulling, lifting, all of those different things, the muscles are meant to reflexively be working without us even knowing. And so if we don't have a bladder or bowel or sexual function issue, you know, very likely we'll just go through life not even really thinking about how we use our pelvic floor. It's just kind of doing its thing, right? And so when we start to um, then 
realize we're having a concern or we develop a concern related to something that's happened to us, um, then all of a sudden we're having to think about these muscles and we're having to practice these contractions and, and, and starting to really think about it. And it's, it takes a lot of energy and brain power to really relearn any skill, but mm -hmm. especially that because these muscles are hidden, they're inside. You know, when you're doing a, a, um, a physiotherapy program for a biceps um, strain, for example, or you're trying to train your muscle of your, your biceps on the front of your arm, you can see your arm, your, your eyes can see it, you're moving it. It's, it's much easier to connect with that than these muscles that are inside the pelvis. And we haven't even started to talk about all of those other things that come with the pelvic floor and the pelvic region. You know, a history of it being a taboo topic, not there's not a lot of discussion about our body parts necessarily in our families or with our friends or, or in whatever environments we're in. And so that's layered on top of all of this. Plus, we don't often talk about bladder or bowel issues openly or sexual function issues openly. So, so you know, um, when we're talking about pelvic floor function or pelvic floor assessment and training, it's not really just about a muscle, is it, or a group of muscles. It's so much more than that. Um, and, you know, the area of the pelvis is kind of, um, it's a center of protection, right? It's where our reproductive organs are housed. It's where our bladder and bowel is housed. It's a very important center of our body. Um, and um, it, so it can, it can be um, a very private area and an area that we haven't really shared information about with, with anyone. So, you know, we can see why working with a pelvic floor physiotherapist could be like the first time someone's actually really shared any information about this area with someone. Um, and and that, could, that could be, you know, really challenging and difficult. Yeah. I have to say though, like most pelvic floor physiotherapists I've met have been quite personable and very open. And I think to be able to work in this area, it's, um, it's one of the things that we need to be able to be. So, so I'm pretty sure um, most of you, if you were to uh, meet a pelvic floor physio, um, they would probably be very approachable and um, very supportive and create a really welcoming environment. Actually, once you're on this, uh, Susanna, uh, it might be a good time to throw in, um, so I, I believe Julie is a nurse uh, here in Montreal. So uh, mentioning would a physiotherapist that follows postpartum patients also be uh, adequately trained to follow a colorectal patient, like in the same area, but sort of a different treatment or like, you know, are, are, are or it's a specialty or should it, is it just a pelvic floor physio or they're specific to colorectal? Yeah. Um, it's a good work? question. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's many different types of pelvic floor courses that physiotherapists can take. And usually the, the basic courses have to do with bladder continence um, and then perhaps more pain conditions. And there is uh, more separate training for bowel, rectal and bowel conditions. So I would suggest that someone look for someone that's had that additional training. That being said, anyone that's um, been working as a pelvic floor physiotherapist has been trained and been, has experience will be able to assess vaginally and rectally and surface and observation and um, external palpation and be able to um, assess the pelvic floor muscles well. Um, if they haven't taken all the bowel courses, they just might not know um, some of the things that um, are a little more detailed in terms of treatment assessment and planning. Things like the rectal balloon, which will therapy, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Um, but you know, if someone's in a rural area, for example, and they don't have a lot of choice as to pelvic floor physiotherapists, which is very possible in a lot of areas in Canada, um, I think any pelvic floor physiotherapist that's had some experience um, would be able to problem solve with their, their patients. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, thank Thanks. you for telling us that. Um, it's a very good point to know. And uh, I imagine, you know, there is the emotional side of this and in going as well that you touched on. Um, you know, it's not only being embarrassed because we don't talk about this and it's a function that we think um, we should know about. Um, we learned it when we were what going through potty training and never had to think about it again. 
It's just something that happens. So um, thank you for touching on that emotional part of it. There's also something that came up in a group that I was um, reading through uh, the other day. And it's a question that came up that was, um, I, I ended up saying that, yes, you shouldn't have to be embarrassed about it, but maybe you can speak to it, is that going through Lars, you are going through incontinence. So wanting to pick the right time to go to the pelvic floor therapist, um, you know, it, I know I was kind of going, ah, it, today's not a good day, um, you know, but again, Such a good point. it's not always going to be a good day. Um, so can you put some, I guess, calm anyone's fears around should something happen, an accident, is it common? They're not alone. Absolutely. So first of all, I mean, that's such a great point, Connie. Um, if I had a patient approach me, like say they, I often will have some communication before an appointment. And mm. if someone had that concern, I have people approaching me for various concerns. So sometimes they might have a chronic fatigue or chronic pain condition where they, they sometimes need to cancel at the last minute. That's not easy when you're making these appointments and there's cancellation fees, all of these different things. But I've had some people approach me and what I've done is said, let's book you at the end of my day. And if it's a day that's, it's a terrible day for you, then we'll just reschedule, no worries. Um, so, you know, I would, um, I would encourage people if they felt comfortable to reach out to that practitioner, just explain those concerns so that they can reassure them, first of all, in terms of timing, perhaps, you know, if there's a time of the day um, where they know their bowel is going to be um, usually quieter, um, then that might be the time to schedule the appointment. So they might be able to kind of look at scheduling based on, on what they think might work best for them. Okay. Um, and in terms of um, the accidents, well, you know, I think there's super, I would say it's very, very rare. I can't say that it happens often at all. There's protective padding down. Um, people are lying down right? So there's less pressure when you're lying down, when you're upright doing things. Um, and again, um, it's, we're doing a lot of quietening and relaxing the muscles um, and, and relaxing in a good way, which is going to reduce that rectal pressure. So I would just reassure people that, you know, naturally that's going to be a big fear um, for some people. And I can understand that. So I would say like the combination of um, choosing the timing where you're gonna feel more confident and more comfortable, um, having, reaching out to the, the physiotherapist just to express some concerns about, you know, what happens if it's really not a good time, I've made this appointment and, and I can't go at the last minute because, you know, sometimes there can be some flexibility with that. I know that I do that and I'm, I imagine other physiotherapists may offer that because, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, what we really want people to get access to care yeah. So we'll try and facilitate it so it works for someone um, and not put barriers up, but try to take them down so that it's as easy as possible and as comfortable as possible. Okay. Thank you, Susie. I appreciate that. Um, so why don't we move to the next phase and help us figure out, you know, what kind of treatments there are? Because I know there's more than just Kegels. There is. So we talked about this, that first of all, we... Um, don't know what's going on unless we visualize it through exam, but also imaging ultrasound. So I've got a clip of ultrasound coming up, but first we'll talk about biofeedback because there's a lot of discussion about biofeedback, isn't there? So this is uh, basically using a sensor either inside the rectum, you can have a sensor inside the vagina or surface electrodes on the skin um, on either side of the anus, for example. They're connected to leads, which attach to a unit. And so with EMG, it's not delivering anything to you. You're not gonna feel anything using EMG biofeedback. It's basically taking the electrical signals from your muscle activity and then putting it on a computer graph. So this is a picture here on what that EMG might look like, but it's actually, it's actually moving. So this is gonna, the screen's gonna be moving and you're gonna see this happening. And so 
in this picture, this is when someone's contracting. So you can see that the line's going up and then they're relaxing. They're just resting, a little contraction, relaxation. And here, they're building up a longer contraction, longer contraction, holding it and relaxing. And so this gives the therapist the ability to kind of visualize what's going on, but also the patient or the client. And that can be really helpful having that visual confirmation and biofeedback. So this is one of the things you were talking about, Connie, wasn't it the biofeedback that, that you found interesting and helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Because you would know um, the longer you hold, it, it, you can you can be nice and strong and then is go weak like if you can't hold it for say even five seconds nice and strong it, then all of a sudden your muscle starts to weaken and I found that interesting to see it on a machine that told me it wasn't you know the next contraction I did wasn't as strong as the previous one the more I did I got weaker and weaker say right so yeah. Yeah. I knew I had to keep practicing that or the release wasn't as quick. So then I wasn't doing it correctly and I need to practice the quick release. So I found, I did find it very helpful. Yeah, I think. And so what you're describing is, is that endurance piece, right? So you can get a good contraction on, but you just can't hold it. And so if we think about what we need to be able to calm that urge and be able to walk to the bathroom is to be able to hold that while you're moving, which is not easy. Right. So there's first of all, you have to have the right muscles engaged. Secondly, you have to be able to do that upright. Then you have to be able to do that while you're moving. Right. So this is kind of how it's the rehab is layered. All of those things are different steps. And so absolutely um, EMG biofeedback is a great tool um, that, you know, a lot of physiotherapists are using. You can still, of course, improve without it but it can be a helpful tool. The other thing that's interesting about biofeedback is that you can use it in standing, right? So we wanna think about rehab and functional positions. So when we're experiencing anal urgency, it's not when we're lying down typically, it's when we're up and moving or, or changing position or suddenly we, we get this urge and then we need to know how to handle it and get to the bathroom. And so we want to train in those functional positions. Should I show you the next one, Connie? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Rectal balloon therapy. So this is actually really, really interesting. Um, here's a bit of tubing and here's the balloon. It's small, of course. And then when we use, but oh. this gets inserted into the rectum. And so then this is attached to this, and this is just a syringe that's just full of air. So basically what happens is this is inserted deflated into the rectum mm -hmm. and then it's inflated gradually. So with rectal balloon therapy, there's so many different ways you can use it. First of all, sometimes someone might have a really sensitive rectum, so sensitive that if there's anything coming into the rectum, a small amount of stool, for example, then we can get intense urgency, yeah. right? And, and the rectum might not be full or the neo rectum might not be full. There might just be a small amount of stool, but it's just hypersensitive. So with balloon therapy, what happens is with the patient or client in a comfortable position, lying on their back or their side, draped, everything's very private. And this is something um, I didn't mention at the very beginning, but whenever we're um, doing an exam, um, someone's privacy, um, is very, very important. So there's always drapage. So there's always, um, we're trying to keep um, everyone's privacy as much as possible. And, and we talked about, I didn't talk about consent yet, but that's in the slides later, is that we would never do an exam. It's always done after full explanation, full explanation of alternatives, um, explanation that a patient or client can always, always, take back consent at any point if they decide they don't want to continue. That's really, really important that everybody knows is that, you know, if you consent to an exam, but then you're like, hmm, I think I might want to stop now. Absolutely. No problem. Um, and so full informed consent always is obtained, needs to be obtained, but that consent can be reneged at any point. Okay. And that's, that's really important. So that being said, with the rectal balloon therapy, um, if someone has a lot of sensitivity in the rectum, then what we would do is just start to inflate it a little bit. And then when that person can sense that and they feel urgent, 
then we would teach them how to breathe and stay calm and just sit with that sensation. They know it's not stool, right? And then when that sensation decreases, inflate it a little bit more, get used to that being there. So they're starting to get used to something sitting in the rectum, being in the rectum to decrease that sensitivity. And so this is the type of thing that we can use rectal balloon therapy for if someone has too much sensitivity. If someone has not enough sensitivity, so someone tends to be more constipated, they have, um, you know, their stool is backed up, for example, they're having trouble emptying their bowel, they're not necessarily getting a signal to go sometimes, and this is what can happen um, if someone has kind of flip-flopped into constipation more, then we can use balloon therapy to help increase sensitivity. It's just used in a different way where we might inflate it until that person can detect that balloon. And then we wanna inflate it a little bit less over time, a little bit less, a little bit less and encourage them to be able to sense that. So this is really effective because it is basically reproducing that feeling of something in the rectum, like nothing else does. Um, and uh, so it, it's actually quite a, a interesting, um, really helpful tool. So Susie, would you do this? Obviously you have to be fully healed and, and get the okay from your surgeon, I would imagine. Yes. Yes. So would you like, is this something that you need to do often because you're stretching, you're kind of stretching that area so it can hold, right? And I would imagine as well that you need to go the same distance every time, no? If you're, if you're trying to increase uh, or decrease sensitivity, then yeah, I think, you know, it's, I think it's, you could think of it as kind of passively stretching, but I also like to think of people learning to be able to accommodate around it. I think it's a combination depending okay. on the tissues, right? Okay. Because, because we want those tissues to be compliable, to yeah. be able to hold, um, allow stool to come into the rectum. And then we need to be able to move the stool out. Now, the, the neorectal area or the rectum is not a storage area. The, like the bladder is a storage area. We're meant to move um, to, to um, void or pee roughly every two to four hours, right? And so it's normal to store. We're, we're not meant to be peeing all the time. But mm -hmm. with, with bowel movements, the, the rectum, we're not meant to keep stool in the rectum for long periods. It's a transition area. Right. Um, but since it's, it's, since it's a neorectum, yes, it's not it's different. Any of that. Yeah, exactly. So this is why um, we can use that sensation of the um, balloon to gradually increase capacity and, and willingness to, to allow more and more fullness in that area. So you could progressively increase how much you inflate the balloon over treatments. Mm -hmm. You would start kind of when that sensation comes on and then you could deflate and then inflate it a bit more and then just continue gradually to increase that. And then you want to see whether there's less urgency when you're not using the balloon. Okay. And how often do you think you'd have to do this? Is it weekly? Because it's such a, because really you, you can't do this on your own. You need a, you need an expert to help you with this. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, we have. Well, I would, I would suggest, because you're investing in the kit too, which is about $60, $70, that's going to be a kit just for the one patient. Mm -hmm. um, and you use a condom over top, which helps with cleaning it, and then you clean with soap and water at home, for example. Okay. I, would, I, would, I would suggest at first maybe trying once a week for a few sessions just to see what, how it's progressing and how things are going. But then you would also be working on some other things as well. And then you would probably do it less often. Um, and you know, um, you probably would use this in conjunction with other, um, treatment strategies as an addition, right. But this would be challenging to use on your own for sure. Yeah. Um, and I, so I think that it would be best to be used with the physiotherapist initially on your own, for, um, sorry, initially with the physiotherapist in the clinic. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that when you mentioned this to me, I'm like, what, there is such a thing. I know. Because it's, I wish our surgeon almost would do this before you go home just to, to get, or even beforehand, right. Knowing that you're going to have, um, even at a colonoscopy or something, if you know, you're getting re your reversal would be great to start 
getting your neo-rectum kind of ready. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much consideration is really given and how much training, you know, um, these doctors, surgeons have in this area. I think there's a bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. Is it harder for people who've had radiation? Well, radiation can change the quality of the tissues, right? Yeah. So the tissues can be kind of less compliant. They can be less mobile. So but it's still, um, yeah. but this would still help it, correct? Um, I actually have not, I, I have not recently looked at research, so I can't say in terms from a research perspective, but I think it makes sense yeah. that it could be helpful. We know that, for example, when um, post-radiation, if, if someone um, has um, those changes in the tissues, they, they use um, dilators in the vaginal opening and vaginal canal just to make sure that those tissues can accommodate, right? So, you know, why would it be different? Yeah. Is there, is there a time when it's too late to do this? I don't think it's too late. No. Okay. Because, you know, our nervous system is a living, um, ever-changing thing, right? And so that's what kind of governs all of these things. We're talking about the brain's connection to the muscle, right? And how it's a lot of brain. That's Mm -hmm. our nervous system. So our nervous system is adaptable and changeable. And yeah, you know, there's changes to tissues that happen as a result of surgery for sure. But then there's other things we can change that help to govern the tissues, right? So what we want to try and do is work with what we have and maximize the function as best we can. Um, and, and, you know, as you work on something, you're going to get a sense of how effective it might be. Right. Okay. So with that in mind, um, although I find the rectal balloon therapy, uh, very interesting, let's go and see what other kind of, um, options are available to us too. So there were some questions about muscle stimulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so with muscle stem, this is where you have a probe into the rectum or the vagina and there's a machine and this time it's not reading the activity from your muscles and putting it on a screen but it's actually delivering current to stimulate a contraction so with muscle stimulation we usually would only use it if someone really had an absent or near absent contraction like very very weak so not for most of our patients so this would be someone that could had a flicker or barely could contract. Okay. And so we would want to use stimulation to stimulate more of a contraction. Okay. If that makes sense. So if someone can actively contract their pelvic floor, even if it's weak, we yeah. would then want them to train the muscles. When we're trying to improve strength and endurance, if we decide that's something someone needs, we want to overload the muscle. We want to overtrain it. Just like if you're going to the gym for any other muscle group in the body, we need to do way more for longer so that we get more muscle strength and endurance. So this would be, you know, held pelvic floor contractions um, and then relaxations in between and doing that to fatigue so that we can get that strength training going. Okay, so, so with this, muscles, this oh, go ahead. Good, sorry, or this is not good. Then, sorry, this would only be to get someone started to the point where they can then use the muscles on their own. Okay. So, I would say a majority of people would not need this. Okay, there's so we were talking about the nervous system, right? Mm-hmm. If someone can contract voluntarily, we want them to be able to train their muscles independently as best as possible. That's the ideal situation. Um, Yeah, we might use um, EMG, like the biofeedback or ultrasound to help someone's understanding and connection with the muscle. Um, But the thing with the muscle stem is that the unit's doing it for you. You're not doing it yourself. So the brain piece isn't really kicking in there, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's just happening. So we really want someone to be able to um, have that direct connection with the muscle with voluntary contraction. And so, yeah, if they can't get there and they need muscle stem to get to that point, we'll use that, but it wouldn't be instead. Okay. Good to know. So this, yeah. So what I'm getting is this is where the balloon, um, for a lot of people with, I'm thinking of urgency, this isn't necessarily, this might be, uh, okay to get the holding started so that, you know, where the muscle is. 
but the balloon would help more so with the um, identifying so that you're not um, going so often. You can actually hold a little bit to get you to yeah. the restroom, basically, because it's yeah. making it less sensitive. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So they're just totally different things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, There's questions about vaginal weights or balls. Yeah. So I had brought this up because not only, you know, for somebody, there was a question coming in at one point before, when we were putting this together was um, the bladder is affected mm -hmm. as well by radiation um, and sometimes even by surgery. So is doing these kind of things at home using the weights and the balls um does that help you continue your practice at home with pelvic floor therapy so sorry was there a question i think susanna has frozen Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dramatic pause. <laughs> um, I, I think there, I, I'm taking down the questions um, okay. and, and then we'll address them, I think, at the end. Just want uh, to make sure we have time. Okay. Well, um, definitely we'll talk about the, I just wanted to look at, because that one question is. Um, yeah, about the. Uh, radiation. Yeah, still going four to six. Frequency. Oh, that's yeah. actually really good in my opinion. <laughs> Wow. Four to six times a day is actually pretty good. Um, Madeline, I know it's a pain. Uh, oh, there's Susanna. Okay. So yeah. Are you are you there okay, Susie? Can you hear us? You're on mute. There we go. Sorry there. about that. That's okay. It happens. We're all on my goodness. The internet okay. zoom world yeah zoom, zoom world so okay. okay so we did talk briefly about i know you're going into kegel weights but if there's um because it's already an, uh, an hour in if we can move a little forward to address yeah. that one question of i know we're getting into um other things they can do so we have talked about the rectal balloon the hyper and hypo sensitivity a bit already right yeah. Um, we're talking about a bit of muscle stimulation. Um, I understand the answers to those because it is about a mind body connection mm -hmm. versus just having something do it for you for one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, so we get into, um, the calming of the bowel mm -hmm. so that someone isn't necessarily going, we talk about urgency already. Um, but then there's the calming component of it. So someone doesn't, you know, I, I, a large patient can go up to 30 times a day. Sometimes it's just mm -hmm. nonstop. Um, I'm wondering if there's techniques to help calm things down. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at it from a neurological perspective, when we use our sphincters our external sphincter, it's supposed to calm the rectum, right? But then we have a situation where there's a neo rectum and it may not, it's not going to respond the way it normally would. So I think with calming techniques, part of it would be looking at calm breathing because when we, we get kind of ramped up, that kind of can increase rectal tone or, or tone in that area. Um, looking at that, using that contraction in a way that doesn't increase intra-abdominal pressure, because I think when we're trying to squeeze everything, then there's more pressure and that can increase urgency. Um, and so um, those are probably the two main things, but then using that in combination with trying to get the stool more organized and bulked, like we were talking about earlier. So looking at adding in um, something like Metamucil or NutriCleanse to really bring more form to the stool so that you're having larger bowel movements rather than many smaller bowel movements. And it's so much easier to hold in a bulkier stool and it's easier to calm when with a bulkier stool. So these urge calming techniques may not be as successful if the stool is very liquid and soft. 
beyond soft. We're talking very liquid, right? Um, it's going to be harder, but putting all of that together might be enough to be helpful. So then we've got kind of the contraction, the urge calming techniques, and then the stool bulking. Yeah, the contraction. So the breathing is a big thing too. And I, yes. I, I know that the first reaction is to do sometimes when you're um, evacuating is to push, but because we don't have those muscles in that way anymore. Um, yeah, someone had told me about the breathing and how, how it's just the more you relax and the deeper you breathe that, and, and um, you're actually opening that area so that things can move smoother yeah. versus- To have a bowel movement? Yes. Yes. Versus trying to like bear down. Yeah. Because you're yeah, actually absolutely. doing yourself a service by bearing down per se. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just, so yeah. So exactly what you're saying, sitting on the toilet, right? Using yeah. something under the feet really helps bring us into that squat position, which is really how we're meant to have a bowel movement. So we've probably all heard of squatty potty, but it could be anything. Having kind of a long trunk, but leaning forward and resting your forearms on your thighs also brings you into that squat position, but it also helps to lengthen the pelvic floor. So remember those muscles we saw at the beginning and how the muscles have to relax and allow that angle to straighten so the stool can come out. So that positioning helps that to happen. And then just like you were saying that breathing, what that's doing is it's helping those pelvic floor muscles to relax and for that external anal sphincter to open. So when we strain, when we breath hold and push like that, what can often happen is that external anal sphincter can close somewhat and make it harder to move the bowels. So if we can really relax and let things open, that can be helpful. I've shared with you here something called the airbag meditation. This is a really um, nice meditation. You can find it on YouTube by Shelly Prosco, who's a physiotherapist and a yoga therapist. And it's for when you're having bowel movements. And so this is um, something that's, that's um, nice to look at. So if any of you are interested, you can have a little peek and see what Shelly has to say. Okay, thank you. I um, I wrote that down. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yes, and stress itself is also really is really important to get a handle on, right? In regards to um, having our our whole bowel actually work efficient yeah. efficiently. I think we ne we neglect that part of it. That's yeah. um, how stressed we are can make a, a really big difference. The bowel has its own nervous system, basically. It's very sensitive to that sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So if we can look at stress management, um, it's not about not having stress because mm. you know life is has stress. We all, everybody has stress, stress happens, but it's looking at stress resilience. And, and there are of course ways that we can try to reduce stress in the things that we can control, but there's so much more we can't control. But what, we know can happen is that if we practice what we call the relaxation response, which is um, really going into that parasympathetic calm state, could be with calm, relaxed breathing, could be with a guided meditation, guided relaxation. It could be with Qigong, Tai Chi, um, some types of yoga. Um, so there's so many different ways we can find this, but practicing this regularly really helps to calm that sympathetic nervous system and that stress response. And it also helps us become stress resilient, mm -hmm. which means that when stress is happening, it just might feel like it rolls off us a little bit more easily. And that's going to be helpful um, for just reducing that fight or flight response of the nervous system. So, you know, the bowel is just like dump and run with that stress response, right? Um, it's, that's kind of what we're wired to do. Um, and so you're right, I think, um, looking at this from a really holistic perspective, and as a pelvic health physiotherapist, this is what we do, practicing that biopsychosocial response, uh, approach rather, is not just looking at the muscles or the specific body parts, but we're really looking at the person as a whole and looking at all of the, these different ways that someone can um, make changes to help improve um, their concerns. And so looking at the stress response, looking overall at activity and exercise we know is really important overall. Mm -hmm. and, and this could include walking regularly or anything that someone really likes to do. 
looking at overall rib cage mobility and mid back movement. Okay, so if we think about abdominal surgery, abdominal scars, there can be um, tightness in the scars or tightness in the muscles. And so looking at trying to improve mobility of those muscles with massage, scar mobility, that's something also that um, we may do in physiotherapy, but people can do for themselves, of course. Um, and uh, making sure that there's mobility in the mid back so we can rotate is really important for bowel health as well. There's a massage called the I Love You Massage, ILU. Some of you might know this one, but this is really um, doing some streeping, uh, sweeping strokes in the direction of the colon movement. So up on the right hand side, over from right to left and down on the left, it can really help with um, gas or um, abdominal irritation. And I think a lot of people find it's really soothing and, and comfortable, but uh, maybe um, we can find a link to um, share with people of what the ILU massage if people yeah. don't have that. So, yeah. so really it's much more than just the pelvic floor. Um, yeah. But, you know, the pelvic floor is important and it's also the part that it's not always easy to, to, to um, evaluate for ourselves. We need help often to get a sense of what's happening there. Absolutely. And it's, it's true. I'm even seeing in the chat that when there is pain um, associated with all this as well, your body tenses even more. So doing yeah. the relaxation exercises and the massages will help manage that as well so that you can also, um, uh, you know, have your bowel more relaxed, be able to, to manage everything, not just yeah. the, you know, not just the function itself, but even the pain. Yeah, absolutely. Like pain, a natural protective response when we're having pain is tension, Yeah. There, right? So the nervous system will protect by increasing tension. The other thing is that if we're having urgency, our tendency will be to hold tension all the time. Um, and, and so, you know, if we think about any other muscle group in our body, like our biceps, for example, if I'm holding my arm like this all the time, well, we can pretty clearly get a sense of how this muscle is going to get sore and stiff and painful, um, after a period of time. And so the pelvic floor is the same. Um, and so we haven't really talked much about pain today, but you know, it's not, um, uncommon especially if there's a lot of holding patterns to have tender spots in the muscles, tenderness, pain. Um, in addition to um, pain, um, say in the genital areas, um, secondary to um, radiation, for example, and tissue changes with that. Um, so pain is definitely a part of this picture for many, many people. And mm -hmm. so then, you know, the muscles and the nervous system's reactivity to that um, do you recommend that patients, sorry, Susanna, do you re recommend then that patients come in, um, you know, with Medicaid, like already haven't taken medication if pain is an issue? And also someone had asked about, you know, Imodium when we were talking about accidents mm -hmm. before, is that something that you recommend typically? So I'm not going to talk about medications because that's not really within right. the physical scope, but, um, you know, it, of course, if someone's having a lot of liquid stool, their physician often is going to recommend that. But what I've also heard is that, you know, there can be this rebound effect of constipation, right? And like getting stuck either in like really liquid or constipative taking a modium, for example. Um, and so I think this is why um, if the stool quality is really challenging um, to work with an, a nutritionist or a dietitian or a naturopath, um, adding in stool bulkers and trying to get a balance in that stool so that it's not kind of flip-flopping back and forth. Okay. I think that could, that could be really helpful um, because that is, you know, such an important piece to the puzzle is trying to get, trying to find that balance there. Um, and in terms of um, pain medication, well, I mean, if someone's regularly taking pain medication, then you wouldn't want them to change what they would normally do. If they're coming in for physio, but um, they shouldn't need extra pain medication. Physiotherapy should not be painful. Um, and as we're working in this biopsychosocial approach, we're really trying to work non nociceptively And what that means is that we are not wanting to produce pain as part of our assessment or treatment. So everything we're doing is um, really with um, the goal of not increasing sensitivity or pain and trying to make things as comfortable as possible. 
Um, so, you know, if someone's having pain with something, there's a reason why we want to look at that and look at ways to decrease that sensitivity. So that would be part of the treatment program. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else that we want to specifically cover, or should we open it up to the room since we're at um, uh, almost an hour and, and 15 minutes? Because we were kind of hoping to keep it to an hour and a half. Yeah. So if anyone would like to ask any specific questions, I'll just stop here for now before we continue on, because I know there's a lot to cover if we wanted Absolutely. to keep going. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I did have a whole slide on sexual function because that's yeah. a huge piece as well that we often can address in pelvic health physiotherapy if that's part of the client's goals. But I mean, I understand that we're running out of time, but I just want everyone to know that we're not forgetting to touch on this, that um, this is yeah, a really significant a piece. Yeah, yeah, that's an important one. and and. And I think more of a taboo subject that people don't tend to kind of jump out with. So I, you know, if everybody else is good with it, I think you're, you have all our ears, Susanna, okay. to continue oh, okay. just about that piece, Perfect. if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Let's so, get into that if you don't mind, because it is a huge topic. And I know um, uh, my eyes were even opened on this recently because um, not everyone is told about how um, for a woman, the, 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 the top of the vagina can close after radiation. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a bit of a, um, what's the word? A fear around, um, I know people who have closed because they were told, don't worry about it right away. It's not a big deal, but then nobody knows how someone reacts to radiation anyway, mm -hmm. right? So that's the radiation is one part of it and having that part close. Um, I was told not only dilators, but if you use a pessary that can keep it open, is that as another solution? So that's really interesting, Connie. Um, I have not heard about that, but I do know quite a bit about pessaries and I did kind of do a little search and I couldn't find any information specifically about that. But if we think about using a pessary, this is a silicone orthotic device that, um, we can put into the vagina to support the urethra, the bladder, the uterus, or the rectum, in case there's a little bit of prolapse, for example. Um, and because you're moving it through the vagina and then it's filling a space, um, I think it would keep the top of the vagina open, but the bottom area of the vagina might still be closed. And so sometimes people are using pessaries and keeping them in for quite a long period of time and then having them taken out by the gynecologist and, and cleaned and then reinserted. And then some people are very independent with their pessaries and they can insert them in and out in, in a single day, right? They might use them for exercise or for part of the day and then take them out. So I think if you're, if you're moving something in through the vagina and taking it out, um, there's less likely that those tissues are going to be adhesed. Whereas if something's in there, but then the bottom tissues are close to close together and mm -hmm. there's nothing else going in, then there's potential for those tissues to be, to become uh, more adhesed. So I think um, that would be my, my question and wanting to clarify that. Yeah. And then with, with no. dilators or accommodators or inserts, these are of course, um, um, different devices either made out of silicone, some are made out of wax and um, you can, or plastic, and you move them into the vagina and it kind of fills that space. There's varying sizes. You start from smaller and then and gradually increase to a size that you want. Um, if someone is um, having, um, wanting to have penetrative um, sexual activity, then they, they might want to increase it to the size of what they want to have inside. Um, and so because that's kind of moving through the whole vaginal canal, that's going to keep the space open. So, I mean, it was really interesting about the pessary and I, I want to investigate a little more about that because I can see the potential and you just would want to make sure that it's moving in and out more regularly, right? That would be my, my comment. Good to know. Yeah, that's really good to know. Um, okay. Is there anything we want to cover more so uh, in just looking at some notes here? Yeah. Can you see my slide? No. Is it open? Oh, no, I have my what's going on with my slides, but something I apologize. I've been sharing these. I guess when I got kicked off, it didn't share again. I'm so okay. sorry, everybody. That's okay. 
So I'll just show you this one um, sexual function slide because I think that would be helpful. There okay. we go. Okay. Mm, there we go, yeah. I'm gonna find the slide, apologies. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we know um, that sexual concerns are actually really common um, after this procedure. Um, often vaginal pain, dryness, and restriction after radiation, for example, we talked about the dilators. There's also a really high incidence of erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunctions. Um, and so I don't know how much that's shared or discussed or whether how much treatment people are seeking or help. But um, I think it's really, I was surprised at the, um, the stats when I was reading. And I think it's really important for people to know that there are health professionals that their job is to help people with their sexual function. So as pelvic health physiotherapists, we play a role so we can help people with um, learning how to use dilators, for example, learning how to relax their pelvic floor as they use the dilator, that's really important. Um, looking at um, pelvic floor exercises to help improve circulation for erectile dysfunction, there is some evidence to show that that can be helpful. Um, and then talking about lubricants, vaginal moisturizers, and using toys as a way to integrate some novel activity that might be really helpful for, um, you know, sexual um, function, either with self or with partner. And so it's also, I think, really important for people to bring this up with their physician if this is happening. Um, I'm not sure about different centers around Canada, but I know in Vancouver, we had the UBC Sexual Medicine Clinic. Um, and there's, of course, sex therapists um, that are trained to help people with sexual dysfunction or problems with sexual function. Um, but this is a quality of life issue. This is an ADL, activity of daily living. Yes, we might not be you know, engaging in sexual activity daily, but what that means is that um, from a physiotherapy perspective, this is as important as someone's ability to do other things like walk, um, go to the gym, um, whatever it is. So this is, this is an important piece that we definitely don't wanna forget. Yeah, thank you. Because I think it also is one that we have trouble at talking about with our physicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. We'll get sweeped under the rug and no one swept under the rug and no one wants to talk about it. So you just live with it. Yeah. Um, and, and it, it does, it hurts relationships for sure. Yeah. Um, a big part of a lot of pelvic health physiotherapists. So I know for my practice is sexual function. I, I, I'm every day I'm helping people with this um, because it's really important. So it's just, some, I think if everyone can, um, um, try to find a, a healthcare practitioner that's comfortable working in this area if they feel so inclined to do so. Again, we don't want to make any assumptions about sexual activity. Not everybody wants to have sex or they don't, it's not on the menu for them. It's not kind of part, one of their goals and that's okay, of course. But I would say that if anyone wants to be able to be sexually active and they're struggling or having difficulties, then absolutely we want them to have the support that they need. Thank you. Um, once we're sort of just on the topic of specific therapists, and uh, there was a question just about um, how to find uh, a, a, you know, a pelvic floor therapist, how do you go about doing the search? Uh, this was specific yeah. to the Toronto area, um, but how would somebody uh, just in general, I guess... Yeah, there's different, there's different ways to search. So in Ontario, for example, Pelvic Health Solutions has a, um, it's a training um, base for pelvic floor physiotherapists and they have listings. Um, you could go to the Ontario Physiotherapy Association and I believe they would have a, um, a way, a listings um, service for physiotherapists. In BC, we have the Physiotherapy Association of BC. So every, um, every province has their own college and association. Sometimes they're combined, sometimes they're separate and they, um, the associations should have um, a way for you to um, look up a physiotherapist. And then you would put pelvic floor, for example, in the search engine. But what I would mention is it's kind of interesting because in some provinces it's protective practice and others it's not. So sometimes people can say they work with pelvic floor, but they are not trained to do internal and vaginal or rectal exams. And they would just treat the pelvic floor verbally while they're doing other exercise instruction, right? So, um, so you wanna make sure that you look up the clinic, look at the bios, look at their experience, look at what courses they've taken and just um, make sure that you um, get that information before you book in. 
And, you know, I think it's absolutely fine if you have some questions to email the physiotherapist. Um, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely welcome that. And I think we all should go into these experiences eyes open. And if we have a question to feel like we can ask that um, so that it's a positive experience. And they, I'm sure they have also reviews for a lot of these physiotherapists and, you know, um, forums where you can kind of ask other patients. Um, yeah. Does there, that, does that exist? There, I mean, reviews, I don't know. I kind of stay away from all that stuff. <laughs> fair, fair. I just don't think, I, I don't, I mean, I think there's probably a, a positive role for that, but me personally, I wouldn't want to look into that for me. Um, but um I think I do get a lot of clients that have been told from other people. So-and-so, my, my friend went here, my, word my of mouth. colleague, word of mouth. So I think that's always very helpful. And, and I don't know, it, maybe there's a form through your organization where people can share positive experiences. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's helpful if, if you know someone that's had a good experience, that's always a good start. Okay. Um, and sometimes your health professionals that you work with will have physiotherapists that they know and have worked with as well. Okay. That's yeah. true. The surgeon's usually a really good place to start um, as well, especially, you know, different provinces, they would probably well be well connected. Um, and, and giving us, you know, knowing now, um, Susanna, how it works is that uh, they need the additional education based on um, you know, it's not just uh, someone trained in pelvic floor, but do they also have, um, are they trained in bowel? Are they also yeah. trained in, so that makes a big difference. And someone had mentions, you know, what kind of questions to ask. I would definitely start with that is, are you also trained in not just urinary incontinence, but are you also trained in, trained in bowel incontinence or, yeah. um, you know, or in the bowel in general, right? So that you know, you're getting someone who understands like yourself, the full pelvic floor. Yeah. And just bowel conditions, right. And, conditions. and having just a little more education about that for sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You could ask specifically like what type of modalities they might use. There's some great physiotherapists out there that might not have any modalities, right. They might just do, um, vaginal rectal exam exercise, um, biofeedback by touching and right. they might be excellent right so it's not that the more modalities you have the better it's it's just that it ha gives you a few options right and so you you might have heard connie talk about biofeedback umg and might think hmm, i really think i want to try that so you might try and find someone that offers that right um, but someone that doesn't offer that may still give you an, an equally great experience right so it, it, it's um it's about the professional themselves, but sometimes these extra modalities can be helpful. Um, in regards to the modalities, I, I had a question because it had come up for me at one point, but the sacral nerve stimulation, have you heard of that? Because I know yeah. that um, uh, at one point it was my GI that was saying, oh, maybe you need to find a, you know, a pelvic floor physio who offers something along those lines to see if it's, it's, if it's what you need, but oh. I don't think it's pelvic floor that does that. Correct. No, that's a, that's a, that's a unit that's implanted. Yeah. yeah. So surgically implanted and then, um, so I think that's it's urology. Kind of, eh? Yes. But, yeah. yeah. So that's not physio, that's urology. But, urology. Okay, but, urology yeah yeah but urology. you know me there's muscle stimulation right so this is where there could be some confusion in terms of the the wording um i'm just thinking you know, as well. because you often yeah. doctors know what direction to push you in and we have to be our own advocates absolutely i mean there is some evidence for that being helpful okay um so but again that's not a physiotherapy thing at all that's medical Okay. Yeah. And I don't think many people do this. I think we had a patient who had been asking about this a while back and literally there was like one doctor somewhere in Toronto, a urologist that performed this type of procedure, you know? Um, so it doesn't seem like it's something that people typically even know about. Well, yeah. um, the, um, the sacral stimulator, I've just read in the research, so I don't really know kind of clinically day to day how okay. people would access that. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. 
Yeah. I know that it's, someone had put that in the notes. It is, it is hard for in Canada. I know that mm-hmm. my, mm-hmm. my surgeon was like, I don't have, um, we're not, we're not equipped with that mm-hmm. at the moment. Maybe Toronto is more mm-hmm. so from what I understand, or they're trying to get it in Vancouver, but mm-hmm. it's not available yet. And it's not covered if it, even if, well, I would it. imagine it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Just with what, yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah. Um, I all, do you know anything also about um, bulking agents? Uh, well, psyllium, metamucil, okay. um, Nutri-Cleanse. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, there's different ones out there, but some of them actually, um, as we haven't really talked about this and this again is kind of a little bit beyond the scope of physio, but what we do know is certain foods are going to trigger more irritation and softer stool. So this is where the dietary piece is really helpful to, to work on. And I know you've had a dietitian, I believe, come and talk. Yes. Um, but with some of the bulking agents, there are some like um, inulin that can be more irritating and upsetting. And so you want to kind of choose your bulking agent um, well. So psyllium is, you know, and Nutri-Cleanse have been helpful and not as um, bothersome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think. That, I just that goes to the basics. If, yes, to go to the basics. So that gets us back to the ensuring the quality of our of our mm-hmm. stool. Um, yeah. Is there any other questions? Just looking at we're at five thirty. Is there any other questions anyone want to bring forward or put in the chat? I know foods are a big thing, and and yeah. we, um, I do want to say that we have um, the last two videos are on the YouTube channel for Colorectal Cancer Canada. Should anyone want to go back and revisit the nutritionist and the naturopath? And this one will be on there as well at one point. Yes. 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 And it's it's in the chat. I will try and find it that I posted. Um, yeah. Right. Well, there's a one, there's one message. Someone squeaked in. Uh, oh, yeah. Talking about the quinoa. Uh, quinoa. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like one patient, I think yeah. everybody's different, but yes, can, yes, there's everyone's got their own little tricks, say. Eh? Which is great. It seems like a pretty inexpensive and healthy oh, way to do it. I can uh, see the name of the woman who has, yeah, it's Shelly Prosco. Okay. So I'll just pull up the slide so that you can see it. There. Okay, Shelly. We can all do it tonight. <laughs> the airbag <laughs> meditation. <laughs> hey, oh, okay. I'm writing that down too. Awesome. Thank mm, you. Trying to find this YouTube. Okay, well, in, in any event, if you at, at the very least don't see it in the chat and you Google uh, Colorectal Cancer Canada on YouTube and you hit videos, you'll see all the videos, all the webinars that we have, um, you know, over the last couple of years and certainly the Lars series, the first two parts from October are there, um, holistic medicine and, uh, and nutrition. And uh, uh, Susanna's, uh, this presentation will also be up there shortly. Um, so, uh, so amazing, great info. Thank you all so much. Feeling less isolated and hopeful, which is wonderful. Thank you for that comment because this is exactly why we offer these and uh, and bring professionals into this space so that we can have these intimate conversations. Uh, and we really thank everybody so much for attending and uh, thanks Susanna for her incredible knowledge and time um, and effort and putting this together for us and for who um, and, and you know, provide and shares her story with us, which is you know makes it all the more yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's so been a pleasure. If, uh, thank you very much, Susanna. Um, great to have you, and hopefully we'll we'll uh, we'll see you back at some point. We would love to have you back at some point. Oh yes, sure. I'd love okay. to come back. Thank, thank you all for attending. Um, much appreciated to have your, your present presence here and, and questions and comments come forward. Thank you. Hi, Sandra. Good to see you. <laughs> and I'm putting for one last moment, the, uh, 
you know, the push for your tush and the uh, link to this year's conference in May is in the chat. So please, everybody, um, you know, register and the information is on our website as well, www.colorectalcancercanada.com. And we hope to see you all there. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.